Hello. That be heard. Best that we can. I just got out the shower and my hair is a total poofy mess. Poofy mess, and that is okay. Because we're about to just love ourselves whatever we look like. <laughs> okay, let's see what I can do to maybe get some light going on here before we start class. Mm, what can we do to get some light? Do that. that. Okay. That's better. Well, that's a lot better, isn't it? My hair looks funny. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> uh, so let's, I'll do this. Okay, everyone, so if you're watching this video, this is uh, part three of my Advanced Emotions for Dummies course. Um, it's also the middle of June, and I'm just gonna just, I, any, anytime I teach a class, I like to do a general sort of like check-in, how are you doing today, how are you feeling, and actually wait for some responses. So uh, I'm gonna just check in with myself in this moment. Um, I've been dealing with a lot of agoraphobia and anxiety the past week. Um, it's just been coming up really bad. It came up, it, it, it came up exactly this time last year when I went on a trip to Mexico. Um, uh, and it's a lot of just repressed feelings of fear, is what it is. And I'm uh, getting in touch with that. That's what I've been doing the past week. So it's been a really rough journey of a lot of crying and a lot of letting go and doing these exercises from last week, the um, over, overcoming toxic shame exercises and a lot of that. Okay, so that's my life. So however you're doing, check in with yourself, see how you're doing. And actually take the time and then check in with yourself. Check in with your breath, check in with your body. You know, we're not here to judge what we feel is right, wrong, good, or bad. We're just here to notice and make space to feel it through. Okay. Scan your whole body if you want to. Head to toe, every little part. Head, neck, chest, shoulders. Lower back, legs, feet. How are you feeling? How are all those parts feeling? Just get reconnected for a bit. Uh, in case you don't know who I am, although I guess I explained this in an earlier video, but my name is Dr. Donnie. Um, and I actually got my name legally changed to uh, Donnie. I don't have a last name anymore. But if you look me up, I, I was uh, Donovan Caesar at one at, at a recent past in my life. So that's my name as well. And I'm a professor, a sociology professor at CSU East Bay in Hayward, California, in the Bay Area. And my work is in social emotional learning or teaching people how to process their feelings. Uh, I have a whole series I offer. I have two series I'm offering, Emotions for Dummies and then and Advanced Emotions for um, the, the Emotions for Dummies class, I will post that as time goes on, because I didn't do it the last time, so I will do that. Um, I will do that when I teach the class again. And uh, I offer this advanced class, which you may be watching this video now. Uh, in previous classes, our first class, we did an exercise called Inner Baby Work. Well, actually, the first thing we did was we talked about emotional abuse in detail, in detail.
detail, grand detail, but you know what that is. And then we discuss inner baby work or self-soothing exercises. Okay. So in and then we had a second class where we discussed inner child work and how to heal from guilt and shame. And there was a whole series of exercises about how to unrepress toxic shame and guilt uh, from your core. Okay. And then this week, this week we are doing how, how to grieve. Actually, you know what? Let me pull it up. So let me turn this share screen business on. And uh, let's see. This says share screen. Okay. Let me, is it here? I thought it was here. Okay, hold up. Oh no, that's emotions for dummies. So hold on, let me find the. Here we go. So all of these exercises come from a workbook I'm putting together called the Book of You. Book of You is a series of 16 or so exercises. That each one that is devoted to helping you deal with your thoughts and feelings. Okay. Um, I was looking for a publisher, but. Um, well, I got turned down by one company. So I decided I think I'm gonna go ahead and turn it into an app and then just, you know, five bucks, you get the app. <clears throat> Since it's a workbook, you know, if I make it an app, you can then print it out as much as you want. You'll have it forever. So pay five bucks, you get the app and then you can print it out on your own. But I'm, anyway, I'm working on that. Just, just, just give me a second here. Uh, to do, a, I did a lot of self care today because I've been dealing with so much fear. So I did a lot of resting in bed, and I took a long steam. I have a portable steamer. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a portable steamer right there. Um, ex portable sauna, portable sauna that I own, and um, which I highly recommend. You should, everyone should get one of those. And a portable sauna and uh, yeah, long shower. I just took a really long shower. So been really hyping up the self care lately because, because what else is there? Who else is going to take care of me? How else are we going to get through COVID-19, right? Self care is so important and not just like a general self care, but really like day to day, moment by moment. How are you taking care of yourself? And what I realized was there's always what's going on and how you are taking care of yourself. So there's always two things going on at any given time, at any given moment in life whatsoever. There's always what's going on and how you're taking care of yourself. So even if the worst thing happens to you, you know, the, the foreclosure happens, the, the, the breakup happens, someone dies, there's always someone died. And how are you taking care of yourself? Okay. Something to keep in mind, okay? As you can see here, we also have, we also discussed the self-care plan, I believe, on the first class. So, you know, this was all about asking yourself what triggers you, when you feel something that you can't handle is gonna happen, what are your honest go-tos for dealing with your feelings, and then what are healthier options? When you, can think, when you think you're about to cry, what is your honest reaction? What is a healthier option? We had a big discussion about that as well class one. I just want to point that out. Okay, so you might want to revisit that. Uh, each one of these classes is advanced for a reason. It's going to dig. Okay, so this class is no different. So, so spend some time thinking about that. Check in with yourself. Can I handle what I'm going to be told today? So just so you know, here's a table of contents from the book of you. Um, uh, so the first half here is, uh, and this is an actual college course that I teach, just so you know. Uh, or as part of it anyway. The first half of this is my Emotions for Dummies class. And then the second half of this is all the advanced classes. So we did this week one, inner baby work. And we also talked about this. Week two was inner child work. Okay. So this week we are doing grief and recovery. We are talking about how to grieve. Okay, so that's on page 40. 
How to grieve. So this is so important because, you know, you know, some of us grew up in environments where when, when stuff happened to our families, like, you know, a death happened, the dog died, we had to move. When something like big traumatic, you know, happened, some of us were lucky enough to have families that we all huddled together. We, we held each other. We allowed ourselves to feel whatever we're feeling. Okay. <laughs> And then some of us had families where we, we got told what to feel. We got told to stop feeling. Your feelings are inconvenient for me. Um, um, you got told the only way to deal with your feelings is to swallow it and not tell anybody about your feelings. Uh, you got told to blame all your feelings on someone else instead of, instead of sinking into your own feelings and getting in touch with your own, getting in touch with your own feelings. Okay, so, so for that reason, a lot of us got taught just a series of super unhealthy things about how to deal with our feelings. Let me pull up. A lot of us got taught, I want to show off this shirt because I really love this shirt. I'm very proud of myself for buying this shirt, okay? Floral prints are all the thing now, you know? Okay, anyway. Um, uh, so, so because we were taught all those serious conversation about really what is grief and what would healthy healthy grieving even look like okay and while i'm saying all this what's running through my mind right now is i'm thinking of when my grandfather died my uh grandfather on my mother's side that happened when i was in college i went back home you know, I can recall my mother telling me how she reacted to the information, but basically, you know, she cried until she was in a better place and then she called me. I recall I, she, she called me. I had like a, okay, whoa, whoa, and then I had a breakdown 20 minutes later and had to call her back and she was like, yeah, I know I cried too. And I thought that was really interesting because it was sort of like, well, if you had this kind of like huge breakdown over grandpa dying, then... You know, you, you knew how much we all, uh, there's some, some other stuff. We hadn't seen, I, we hadn't seen grandpa in seven years because grandma and my mom got into a huge argument. And so we, I had saw him right before I went off to college and we had made plans. And this wasn't college actually, this was grad school. Um, but we had made plans to, to um, go see him again so he could barbecue like he used to do back in the old days. And I was really looking forward kind of barbecue and the special barbecue sauce he used to make. So, so, <laughs> mm, Grandpa, mm, having a moment right now. Well, anyway, well, 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 I said that story to say my mother didn't teach me healthy grieving. No. Even at the funeral, I remember my mother was catatonic. She didn't reach out for any of us. There was no hugging and touching. She made sure that you know, the, the, the funeral happened just fine, you know. Everything happened on time, the food got served, but there was, there was no, I can't recall any moment of let's all hold each other and hug or, yeah. So anyway, my point there is to say, you might've learned all sorts of unhealthy things about grieving in your life. And so today is the day to, to, to really get crystal clear about how to grieve. And so we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to do some, uh, we're going to do some digging into your own personal life, okay, to learn how to grieve. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. And as always, if you're feeling it, feel free to read along. Uh, but if you're not feeling it, you know, feel free to close your eyes, go into your own inner meditation, go into your own space. This is going to be a video I put up online. You can always revisit it and read this stuff later. The most important thing is to let this stuff bypass the heart, bypass the brain, and go into the heart. Okay. So this comes from the book, The Grief Recovery Handbook by John James and Russell Friedman. Grief is a conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. While it is the most normal and natural thing to feel grief after a loss of any kind, it is also the most neglected and misunderstood experience, often by both grievers and those around them. This is because we are taught how to acquire things, but 
not taught what to do when we lose them. All sorts of experiences come with conflicting feelings. Sure, death, but also divorce, moving, moving, I just moved, starting school, marriage, holidays, financial gains and losses, etc. Also, we could include the loss of an identity, loss of trust, loss of control, and loss of safety. Okay, so that's lots of things you can lose, right? You can start talking about metaphorical things or feelings. That's a lot of things you can lose. Most of us are taught that grief happens in an orderly set of stages that look like this. Okay, so you see there's the Kubler-Ross model. Seven stages of grief, shock, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, testing, and acceptance. And you move from one to the other, right? You move from shock all the way up to acceptance. However, research has shown that people are often not in denial or get angry while grieving. What they do often report is reduced concentration, a sense of numbness, disrupted sleep patterns, changed eating habits, and a roller coaster of emotional energy. This has led to the conclusion that there are no stages of grief. All relationships are unique. So every grief process is unique. Or drawn out, it really looks like this. Okay, so we got here stages of grief. Okay, and there's loss hurt to loss adjustment. Okay, so the, hurt, the initial hurt itself to the adjustment. And from, from hurt, there's shock, numbness, denial, emotional outburst, anger, fear, searching, panic, loneliness, depression, new and then there's new relationships new strengths, new patterns, hope, affirmation, and helping others, okay? So you can go all the way from hurt and experience all these things toward adjusting to the loss, right? This is the actual experience of this chart or the actual experience of grief is you can move from one to the other in all kinds of haphazard, you know, unintentional, bumbling, back and forth, twisted sort of way. So what I like to call the, the, the um, clusterfuck of human experience, okay? You can, you can go everywhere with your feelings. So you can be in shock one day and then, you know, you make a sudden decision to start a new pattern. But then it don't really work out, so you realize you're actually in denial. And then so you start working through your denial um, by getting a therapist and starting a new relationship. But that new therapist brings up your feelings. So that brings up all this, uh, let's say, emotional outbursts. Okay. But, uh, and then, you know, oh, the emotional outburst makes you realize that you've been actually on numb for a really long, for a while, you know? And then you're dealing with so many like back and forths of emotional outbursts burst and numbness. And now you feel like you don't want to be, you don't want to deal with people at all. You're hopeless. So you're really lonely and isolated and depressed. You're feeling all these things, okay? Then maybe you meet someone new, or maybe um, maybe you meet someone new, new relationship, and you start having a conversation with them, but then you can't help but bring up all the stuff from the past that traumatized you, and and, it's, and, and just just over overshare those people, okay? So re-entry troubles. So then you try again. And you talk to that, the person you're talking to actually is having their own problems. And when they tell you what's going on with them, you're really good at listening and you have really great advice. You discover a new strength because you've been overcoming all this really hard stuff. Okay, so as you can see, you can go everywhere in this chart, everywhere. And that's the whole point, which is that it's about validating your feelings. Whatever you're going through is valid, okay? Whatever you're going through at any given moment, you're going through it for a reason, even if it doesn't make any logical sense to you, okay? Your emotions have a logic of their own that we all need to learn how to tap into. Okay, so grief is about a broken heart, not a broken brain. It's about dealing with feelings, not intellectual rationalization. So often when people are grieving, we say something like, don't feel bad, it'll be better next time. These statements are intellectually true, but emotionally bankrupt. In fact, our society teaches us six unhealthy things about grieving. 
Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Grieve alone. Go be by yourself with your unpleasant feelings. Just give it time. Be strong for others. And just keep busy. Just keep busy. Okay, we can easily think about which one of those is your main go-to, because we all have them. That's how our culture works. Mine is number six. Just keep busy. Okay, I'm big on that one. Big on that one. Just keep busy. I got a little bit of don't feel bad. I definitely have grieve alone. That's definitely my other one. It's grieve alone. Uh, I, it's connecting with people is nice, but and it really helps sometimes. It really, really does. But I have a strong tendency to grieve alone because of my childhood situation, which we're all going to work on in a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. So whatever ones you got, just pay attention to those. All of these ideas teach us to avoid and hide our true feelings, leaving us feeling unheard invalidated, even judged and criticized. Consequently, many grievers opt to just be left alone, social isolation. Or they learn how to fake it in recovery by pretending to be fine and put on a happy face. Additionally, the pain of unresolved grief is cumulative, so any future losses can re-trigger past hurtful experiences. A lifetime of unresolved grief absolutely debilitating okay and that's that's also equally important um you can have this COVID 19 thing can happen and then you suddenly can trigger a memory of you something painful that happened to you when you were 10 that you blocked out pretty well but things got so crazy because of COVID 19 that suddenly it comes back up or i should say not the maybe not even the memory but the pain of what you went through could come back up Okay, that's a real possibility. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a real possibility, okay? Recovery happens through a series of small and correct choices we make about our thoughts and feelings. It means acknowledging that everything you are feeling is important and perfectly understandable and that this is part of what it takes to claim your life back. Often it means developing skills we should have learned in recovery. Often it means developing skills we should have learned in childhood. Recovery can happen at any time when the griever is ready to talk about and review what happened. It does not happen if you just give it time. And there is no loss that a person cannot recover from. We would never tell a person who broke their leg to just give it time. The same goes for emotional pain. Okay, we must accept that while help can... Oh, I got to say something. I just want to just say this. We actually had a student uh, over the summer, in the last month, who committed suicide, who was a, a, a student of mine, sat in the front row of my class, did all the exercises, but never once came to me and said there was something going on. And so, you know, I think all of us, well, certainly as a professor, we're all kind of like mentally trying to see how we're all going to deal with the realities of the stress everyone's dealing with. And, and like I said, the, another truth is often the current event like COVID-19 or whatever comes with that can trigger a whole bunch of previous grief stresses from the past as this worksheet demonstrates. Okay. So, um, so a lifetime, a lifetime of unresolved grief can be debilitating a lifetime of unresolved grief. Can, can lead to you suddenly making a, a, a snap decision that you can't take it anymore. Okay, so that's, where, that's really why this is so important, even though grieving is very painful. Okay, it's painful and it's important. Okay. I didn't want to hold on to that in my mind, so there you go. <laughs> we must accept that while help can come from others, or we can pay someone $150 an hour, only we will know how we truly feel. So one, start with acknowledging that all grieving is about wishing for something different, better, or more. It's fighting an acceptance of what is over what you want. You can use the how to let go exercises to help your ego deal with the loss. 
Uh, there's another exercise in my workbook on how to let go. Okay, so start with acknowledging that all grieving is about wishing for something different, better, or more. Two, only you are responsible for your feelings. We often say you made me angry, but in reality, things happen and we choose how we respond. Like, I reacted to what you said with anger. We may absolutely not be responsible for the past, but we must take responsibility for how we react currently if we want to take our power back in feeling. Okay. And I'm, I'm guilty of the you made me angry also. Okay. That's something I'm definitely got to work on. Three, think about doing grieving work with someone you can trust. You can do it alone, but since social isolation is such a big issue in grieving, it can help to reach out to friends and people you trust. Also, focus on you addressing your feelings, not reaching out to those who hurt you. They may not or may never be in a place to grieve, and it's their business. If it happens, it will happen for them in their way on their time. Okay, now some of that's a little bit of my edits to the book. <laughs> but I, I was going through this myself with my own family okay so uh the point is is to try to connect with people if you can if it helps that's important and connecting with people is about you getting in contact with your feelings so you can heal it's not about healing so everyone else can apologize to you it's not about uh getting everyone else to realize what, what they did wrong it's not about pushing therapy onto other people None of that works. Every now and then you'll get somebody who might be interested in a little bit of it here and there. You never know. But I find on the whole, the goal is you have to look at you. Focusing on other people's lives is just moving you back to a state of victimhood or keeping you in a state of victimhood. You have to take responsibility for your feelings. So, okay. So it's not Christian missionary work, okay? It's, it's really an inner journey. Grieving and healing is really an inner journey here, okay? It's entirely possible that the people who hurt you will never, ever apologize, okay? It's amazing because we're living in this moment of Black Lives Matter and white people are taking down statues and, and, and removing Native American figureheads and all that stuff, and that's amazing. It's kind of like a huge apology in some ways, okay? And, and even then, I acknowledge that that apology is not about me. That apology is what they need for them. And, what, and, and yeah, and that apology is about them. The only apology that really matters to me is the one I give myself. And, you know, I actually watched um, Jimmy Fallon give an apology uh, yesterday, and I cried. I cry. I cry all the time. I watched Jimmy Fallon give an apology, and I realized all this time how I could have given myself that apology and just let let racism go, <laughs> or 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 if not let it go, realize again how what's happening the racism and how was I treating myself? How was I treating myself? How poorly have I treated myself when these things happen to me in my life? That's not about the person who did this to me. It's about me. <laughs> and so there's all these ways. Of, yeah, there you go. That's an important part of the healing process is to take responsibility for your feelings. Okay. okay. So we were on one, two, three, and here's number four. Number four, go back to that list of six bad social beliefs about grief and see which ones you have believed in and questioned them. All responses to grief are normal and natural, no matter how wrong or crazy. Crazy behavior, it's a good time to question how someone is grieving. Okay, as we saw from the, from the chart here, this would, this would be the sign of a crazy person, really. Okay, so, so any kind of crazy behavior, instead of just writing that person off, you may want to question, what is that person dealing with? What, what are they grieving? What kind of trauma did they experience? That sort of thing. Okay. We've all been there. 
And then five, finally, acknowledge that people all mean well when they attempt to offer help to others. All of these six bad social beliefs can be heard in a kind way to offer, as a kind way, to offer healthy sympathy for people's pain. So instead of that, you could say, so instead of don't feel bad, you could say, your pain is so strong. Please also take notice of the positive things in your life. Oh, I like that. I added this recently. Okay. So you, instead of saying, oh, don't feel bad, you could say, oh gosh, your pain is so strong. You pain, you have so much pain right now. Please also take notice of the positive things in your life. Okay. Replace the loss. Instead of that, you could say, losing something hurts so much. If you get something that fills the hole, it will help with slowly working through the pain. Okay. So, you know, you could hear replace the loss and, you know, move on. But instead, you could hear, you could hear it as, well, it's just painful to lose something. So getting something that fills the hole can help with the feelings over time. Okay, the next one, instead of saying grieve alone, go be by yourself with your unpleasant feelings, you could say, well, it can hurt so much to discuss these feelings that you may want to prioritize taking time for yourself so you're not stuck in a triggering story. Okay, and you just honor that somebody may want to be alone during a traumatic time in their lives, a grieving time. And then the last one, just give it could be heard as your feelings aren't really that important. But you could hear it as the suddenness of things makes everything hard to deal with. We all need time to process our feelings. Okay, that's so true. So true. You know, the the, the painful things that happen in life often happen all of a sudden. Bam. But the, the, the processing of our feelings doesn't happen all of a sudden. It happens in a kind of intentional way or doesn't happen at all, or it happens in little bits and pieces when we're ready to handle it. So it's important to just give it time. Sometimes really is an important thing you can say. But it's important to convey a sense of it's hard, so give it time as you work through it, not straight up just give it time, as if time itself will fix your feelings, because it won't. Okay, so, so as you can see, there's, there's ways in which we say those things that we mean well, but they're not exactly the most accurate or emotionally helpful way to offer someone uh, how to grieve or to, how to teach ourselves how to grieve, okay? Okay, so now you just got a whole bunch of wonderful information about grief. So the following exercise will help you to, to learn your own process of grieving, your own processes of grieving. We will write out our life history Focus on a particular relationship, find statements that we need to apologize or forgive, and write a grief letter. Okay, so I, as the, the test person here, we're gonna do, I'm going to do this. Uh, we're going to make time. So this is going to be probably a good hour, and we're going to bank off probably 20 minutes each exercise or so. I'll say little bits and pieces as I do it, and I won't, I won't, uh, I won't take as much time as you might take watching this. I won't take as much time as you might take watching this. So feel free to pause the video for more time and take more time doing this, okay? Okay, so number one is the loss history graph. One, using the line below, illustrate every loss you ever had in your life. The example here has years and events, but you can just use your age. You could just write age 16, came out of the closet. <laughs> that would be my example. <laughs> Start with the year of your birth or age zero, your first earliest memory, and then everything up until today. If you don't have that kind of time or if you've done this before, just focus on a part of your life. Take care of yourself. This can be triggering. Okay. Let's see, there's some blanks here. It's literally just writing out what happened to you. Okay. We're unpackaging the grief. So be careful. Only do what you can handle. Well, let's give me, I'm going to, it's been like five minutes. I'm going to do this right now.
Ideally, this was something you, you, know, you would print out. So, I mean, I guess I could type it into here, but that might be difficult with all the blinks and the whatnot. So I'm gonna do this on a piece of paper right here. Um, I had a specific goal this morning when I said I was gonna do this, but I can't remember what my specific goal was. It was something like, I need to look at something with my mother. Well, I'm doing, dealing with all the agoraphobia. So I, I wanted to deal with, yeah, so I'm gonna focus. So, so, so my particular, now, needless to say, I've done this about 20 times now, okay? So my particular chart, I'm gonna focus on specifically the things that might've promoted my agoraphobia. If this is your first time doing this, please do this any way you feel is appropriate for you. The first time I did this, I wrote all the big traumatic events of my life. And that's probably what you should do if, you're, if this is your first time doing this, okay? You know, whatever comes up for you, you know, the brain remembers things in all sorts of ways. So you might suddenly, like I'm at, I got to age 13 and I'm suddenly remembering something that happened to me at 25. So I'm just gonna put it in as it comes up. Also, needless to say, I'm 38. So if I was, you know, 18, 19 doing this, I actually, you know, what, what this look like, this might look very different. If you're 54, if you're 80 doing this, it might look very different also, right? So just make space for whatever that is. Needless to say, feelings are definitely gonna come up doing this. So make space for your feelings too. And if you're not uh, writing it down and you're doing this in your mind, you know, just organize it in whatever way best makes sense for you. You don't have to go through your whole life. You know, you can pick a part of it. You can just pick you know, just one relative if you want. But we're going to go into more detail about that later.
Okay. Okay, so wherever you're at in your process, just keep keep working, keep feeling your way through it. Um, several things on this list are kind of extremely intimate, so I don't know if I want to just say them all out loud, but I got some of them. I can say some of them out loud, so I'll just give you an idea of what's on my list today. And like I said, I've done this 20 times, so every time, I, every time you'd think you'd write out your life history and it would be the same stuff, but strangely enough, every time you write it out, it's different. Because what comes up and how you're connecting all the dots is different. Okay, so I think I said my timeline was about moments where I might have, how I might have developed all this agoraphobia. I'm working through. Okay, you notice me looking out my window? Hearing conversations, I always felt like if I if I had hadn't become a college professor, if I hadn't become a college professor, I would have opted to be a spy, like working for the FBI. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, it's also funny because it's li literally like 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 I see one black person a day here, and this is older black man I now see walking his dog around here. I have a whole thing around Santa Cruz and being racist as all get out, which it, which it is, <laughs> which, it, which it really is. But, but anyway, anyway, I digress. So uh, here's my list. Think that might have promoted my agoraphobia. Uh, I have age seven that I was, uh, my mom, I stuck to mom a lot. Mom always wanted us to stay by really close to her, couldn't do things on our own. And even in the grocery store, we had to pretty much follow my mom. We weren't allowed to just walk off by ourselves in the grocery store. And I have, when I was nine, I can't go, I can't go past uh, one block down my, down the street of my house. I, um, we weren't allowed to go past one, 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 one block. That was where we stayed, but up and down the street. Uh, nine years old. Okay, I can, uh, you know, when I was young, my, my parents did not allow me to have any birthday parties with friends outside of my house. I wasn't allowed to visit my friends. Uh, my mother had a whole thing about not wanting company in her house and, and, and a whole other thing around not, not particularly liking white people. And so I was forbidden to go to any of my friends' birthday parties uh, after school and all that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, as an adult, I can see that she did it to sort of like protect me from racism. Um, but as a kid, it felt like she was just keeping me from having friends. Uh, so it was pretty, I was pretty painfully upset about this for a very long time. Okay. Then I got older, right before high school, and uh, uh, made new friends, did make friends, made some new friends. Didn't like, had issues with all of them. Felt very alone. Then I got into learning how to play the piano. Very alone doing that. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. There's some other stuff I could, oh, uh, well, another thing that's really important here is when I went, to, I went to college, I went to a predominantly private school, predominantly white college also, uh, which had moments where I felt very isolated, moments. Um, but it was in New Orleans, so, you know, there were, there were, there were black people in the city anyway. Uh, living in New Orleans, I, I drove past, they were hearing gunshots. Um, yeah, seeing, seeing dead people when I moved back there for grad school. Uh, the, the day I got my PhD and I had to actually just leave New Orleans and leave all my friends behind in my social life and move to a tiny tiny little town in Conway, Arkansas for my first teaching job. Then I have New Jersey, Jersey, living in New Jersey where no one says hi to anybody ever. Then I have my me going from being a guy to being more genderqueer and expressive. And that coming with all sorts of bodily changes and how I'm, I'm perceived and read in society. 
And then I, and then I finally, I ended it with being here in Santa Cruz, which is a predominantly white area with a 2%, 1% black population. Okay, so you see there, I, I took a whole bunch of incidents from my life that, that, I, that I thought related to this topic. Although, like I said, you are free to just write this any way you feel is right for you. The idea is to illustrate every loss you ever had in your life, okay? So needless to say, it's probably even a good thing that it changes every single time because that's really painful. <laughs> so, so, um, so just notice you might, your, your first time doing this might be a worksheet where you mention all the big things that happen to you. And then as you do other worksheets, you might get to the finer details, okay? Several of the big things that happened to me were not on this this chart, okay? Which I could I could just tell you, but you know, I was a as a college, as a high school person, I was a day two suicide. Okay. I tried to I tried to commit suicide twice in high school. I grew up in a very, very conservative, homophobic environment. Okay. But that didn't make this list, interestingly enough, okay, when I thought about agoraphobia. That that that, that didn't really make this list. So and so there you go. That's my point there, okay? So just let whatever comes up, come up, okay? And that's an important part of this. Unrepress it. No feelings. And then it says, next, take one or two of your experiences and write it out in detail below. So I just verbally did that with all of you. But if I'm just, just for the, the point of this, I'm going to circle a couple that I'm going to say were extremely important for the thing I'm working on right now. For me, I'm going to say those gunshots and the dead people business, that was very big. I had no counseling or trauma when that occurred 10 years ago. I, that, that's kind of what launched me into my studies of this topic. Because I didn't, because I just kept having all these very strange, you know, I'd hear firecrackers and suddenly I had to run, you know. You know, you, you, know, you can hang out on a 4th of July celebration just enjoying the fireworks. Normally I would be. Then now suddenly I hear fireworks and I just want to run as fast as I can. Or I can't breathe all of a sudden. Still to this day, I can't just enjoy fireworks. I, I hear fireworks and it makes me very tense and uncomfortable. I, I, I don't think they're I don't think they're gunshots anymore, and I don't get that startled trauma response anymore. But but I I can't enjoy them either. Who knows? One day we'll see. Uh, so I'm going to say that that had something to do with fear big time. And I'm going to say leaving New Orleans because that was very traumatic for me to, to, to uproot my whole life and my friends and everything for my job. That was very hard. It was very adult, I suppose, but it was very, very hard. And I'm going to say my mom I'm not having me any friends. My mom having this sort of fear of the world thing herself. Okay. Okay. So wherever you're at on that, like I said, if you need to pause, pause, revisit this thing another time, feel free. You can easily take the whole day and make a, make that chart about your life. Okay. And feel through whatever comes up. Okay. Part two, if you want to move forward, is the relationship graph. So here you get to dig deep and get honest about a particular moment you need to grieve. First, for the experience you wrote in detail, illustrate every moment, every important moment in your relationship with that person, including any feelings after they died or the event that happened. Put positive things above the line and negative things below. Note all of your hopes, dreams, and expectations that went along with each event. Okay, so it has a particular relationship, same sort of timeline, you're just focusing it on a specific person, and then you can write down some of those thoughts about those events. Okay, so the same thing we just did, but just about a particular person. Now, technically, I just did this with agoraphobia. Hmm, well, I'm going to sit with my feelings for a bit. If you need to do this, this exercise, 
I'm going to give you another five minutes to sit and do this exercise. Okay. So if your if your first graph chart was was just your life in general, good, good, and feel free to move on to the second one here, which is a particular relationship. Since I already did one with a particular relationship, I'm going to just we're just I'm just going to sit with my feelings for five minutes. Actually, I could say some things for you as you are working on this, whoever's watching this video. Um, notice what comes up as you outline this relationship. Specific events, general events. The mind works in all of these ways. The memory works in all of these ways. Again, things may pop up oh, that you know you might suddenly remember at one particular time in life that might not happen from just birth to death, birth till today. Um, yeah, again, I, I would reiterate, note any feelings after they die too, or the event that happened, because you're still alive, so your feelings are still ongoing. Uh, some thoughts are coming into my mind right now, because you know, some of this is about my so, um, and some of this is about New Orleans. A lot of this is about New Orleans. So part of me is thinking about what's my relationship with New Orleans. So let me write that down. Hold on. So, I mean, my relationship with my parents, I'm, I'm pretty aware of that one. So I don't need to like do that one in my mind right now, but my relationship with New Orleans, let me just write that one. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna do this. I'm, I'm, I am gonna do this. So this is my relationship with New Orleans. Okay, I remember going there as a kid to see my grandparents and my aunt and cousins on my dad's side. And I, I, I remember, particularly what I remember is holiday food, getting New Orleans black food, you know, like, you know, the kind of food my grandparents would serve. But it was different than what my mom would serve. But that, that really sticks out for me. We didn't go to New Orleans all that much uh, as kids. I'm from a town, I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana, which is a town, a suburban white town about that. Three hours and a half out of the way. I went to college in New Orleans. I went to Loyola University in New Orleans. I wrote that down. That's a big thing, college. Then a year into that, I, well, got a bicycle and started, uh, started traveling around various neighborhoods in New Orleans. So I wrote Loyola, then I wrote The Hood. Then at 20, liking it so much, I called it my spiritual homeland. Then at 21, I moved to grad school in Toronto and, um, and uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina happened and destroyed the whole city and all this 
chaos happened and this martial law got declared and I had to watch the whole thing on the BBC. And I eventually did go back and make a, 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 a radio documentary for this Canadian radio station I worked for. Uh, so I went back and walked around, did a lot of crying and that sort of thing. And then I eventually uh, went back to school for grad school and I went to Baton Rouge and got sick of it. Got sick of being at uh, 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 LSU in Baton Rouge and I chose to move to New Orleans for the first year into the program. And then 28, all the gunshots and everything made me pretty sick of living there. Then I was finally time to go and I actually tried to stay uh, I might have fun if I had more money. Uh, but then I knew it was time for me to like try some other place and try something new. So I made the time for me to go. Okay, so that's my relationship with New Orleans. Okay. I don't know if that's totally relevant or not for what, what we're working on here in my agoraphobia, but that came up and I think it's important. So I wrote it down. Okay, and if I was going to compare my thoughts about New Orleans, maybe with maybe some of my thoughts around the family, I mean, I guess there's some relationship between a sense of what home is, having your sense of home get shaken up, sense of home, your sense of home gets shaken up. You know, you want, you want home, but you're sick of home too. You want home, but you're sick of home too. It's, it's, it's what feels familiar. You know there's love up here, but that love is not completely, you're not getting completely what you need. You also know you're not getting completely what you need to grow, to learn, to grow. I feel that way about New Orleans and my parents. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. Now that was intense. Okay. So here's number three. Like it's only four is the four is the very end, okay? So number three is you take all that stuff you said and you sort them into statements of things to apologize for, things that need forgiveness, and other significant emotional statements. Let me write what I just did for her. Let's see. Walking home. Well, first of all, I said the two things they have in common is home sense of home, wanting home, but it not fulfilling you. Um, home being shaken up or destroyed. Okay, so home being shaken up and destroyed, wanting home, but it not fulfilling you. And like I said, a sense of home. That, that's three things, okay? Okay, so now, things to apologize for, things that need forgiveness. So, so go back over your paper, things you've written, and if anything that comes up as an apology or a forgive statement, forgiveness statement, uh, write it down. So, you know, for example, when I when I when I search past when I think about the gunshots, I lived in one neighborhood in New Orleans that was the most dangerous neighborhood that year, which I did not know. Although I would have known if I had bothered to read the newspaper. Um, but that year there were seven murders that happened a block away from my house. I heard gunshots all the time. I was working on my PhD, and honestly, there were there were days when I thought I should go run and hide in the in the bathtub because I was so scared of uh, the gunshots I was hearing, okay? And then actually at the very end of that year, a bullet went through my wall. I wasn't there that day, but I got home and there was a hole and I convinced myself it was a basketball. Someone threw a basketball against the wall. I convinced myself of all this bullshit. And then I was dating this guy who, well, I had one date with a guy who was a cop. He came over and he was like, no, that's obviously a bullet. And so, uh, and so then I moved the hell out of there as fast as I could. I didn't sleep for a month straight, and then I moved out of there. So when I go back over all that in my brain, um, you know, I could apologize to myself for, okay, let's see. I could apologize to myself for um, not taking, not getting help sooner. Hold up. I'll, I'll put it, uh, let me put it up here. Gotta find me some more scrap paper. 
Well, actually, I'll write it here. I'll write it here. Here we go. Means will probably not being held Not listening to the depth of my trauma. I'm listening to the depth of my feelings. I had all these hurt feelings, but I didn't know how to feel them through. Um, not valuing myself, not valuing my emotions enough to seek. I struggled. I struggled for a while. I really did. Um, another thing that comes up for me is maybe how, how angry I was at me for not making friends when I was younger. Anger at parents for not not helping make friends or be in the world. Okay, so you, as you can see, there's a bunch of things there, okay? And I can do the same thing with things that need forgiveness. Um, You know, I could often write the exact same stuff. Um, I could I could pull from some of these other things here. I need to forgive. I need to forgive. I need to forgive Nola for not being the city I wanted me to be. My friends are not working out the way I wanted them to. My parents for, for oh. Hey. My parents for not giving me the nurturing Okay, and any other significant statements that, that show up? Um, for wanting a home so badly that you constantly move around. Wanting a home so badly, you constantly move around. Or still having thoughts of home that traumatize you. And now these are some pretty honest ass statements here, okay? But needless to say, I've, I've done this 20 times now, so I, I know I can go there and just poof, get there. If you writing this, anyone else writing this, if this is your first time doing this, you may need to sit with these questions for a while. Or not questions. You may need to sit with sorting these statements for a while. Okay. This can be an exercise where you just dump a couple of statements into a couple of blanks, or you can actually sit with what what is it about these things? What is it about this this list I just wrote here? What what do you need to actually apologize or forgive? Or what does someone else need to apologize or forgive? Okay, you could really sit with that for a while and play with it and feel through it and write it out and more lengthier sentences. Okay, to dig into your feelings. Okay, that's the idea there. All right. Okay, I think we're pretty good. I think I wrote down a bunch of good stuff. So let's do number four. Number four is finally you will write a grief recovery completion letter for each statement. 
This letter is a short response to what you have been feeling so you can complete the feelings. It is not a farewell letter or even a forgiveness letter for the other person. It is more of an apology letter for you to complete the sense of closure you need so you can heal. It can be from, it can be written from you to another person or from another person to you. Writing the apology of the people who harmed you can be very liberating. Like all of this, focus on your feelings and your heart, even if things seem silly or awkward in your mind. Okay. Okay, so the example here is dear person's name. As your oh let's let's do this. So if I was doing this to my parents, this would look like this. Dear, uh, let's, let's do it to New Orleans for New Orleans. Dear New Orleans, as a resident in your city, I have been reviewing our relationship and I've discovered some things I want to say. And I apologize for judging you for not being the city I needed. Uh, I apologize for well, New Orleans didn't make it up here, but I apologize for not listening to my feelings. For the times I didn't listen to my feelings and I blamed you, New Orleans, for my feelings. For not, I apologize for... Uh, I apologize for uh, uh, not valuing my emotions enough to seek help and just sticking with blame instead. I forgive you for, I forgive you. I forgive you for not giving me the nurturing I needed, just like my parents didn't. I forgive you for not working out the way I wanted you to. Because I had no control over how you're gonna work out. I forgive you for throwing my feelings onto you. Man, I want you to know New Orleans, you're a special place always. And even though you may change in ways I don't agree with, I still would like to visit. I love you. I have to go. I am ready to let go of this hurt. Some kind of closing and goodbye. Okay. So that's how this this is how this works. You write a letter. Now you can also do this, and I just did it from me to the to the person that I was upset with. You can also do it in reverse from the person who harmed you to you. Okay, and that can be very powerful. So that looks like this. <clears throat> Uh, dear Dr. Donnie, uh, I'll use my parents here. As your parents, we have been reviewing our relationship and we have discovered some things we want to say to you. Uh, we apologize for... Uh, we apologize for keeping you from having friends as a kid because we were so uncomfortable with having to deal with white people or different people that we just didn't want to give it a, we just didn't want to give it a shot. And so it made us uncomfortable. So we shut the whole thing down and we shut you down to it. For that, we are sorry. You know, uh, uh, we, please forgive us. Please forgive us for not taking you to see your extended family more often, for not giving you more space to just play and be free in the world. You know, maybe because you only got to go down one block for a decade of your life, almost a decade and a half of your life. Yeah, a decade and a half of your life. You, you, you know, you might have learned some very unhealthy thoughts about how safe or unsafe the world is. Uh, because we set that up as your foundation when you had other things that might make you feel unsafe, like your race or your uh, sexual orientation and that kind of thing, that may have just made it all much, much more scarier for you. And for that, we're sorry. We're sorry for not giving you the building blocks you needed to be a conf confident, secure person in the world. OK, 
Okay, so these hurt. These all hurt, okay? I don't know if you can see it on my face or not. I, mean, I, I may still be smiling. These things hurt, okay? So let's, uh... So, let yourself feel whatever you feel when they come up, okay? And this is, uh, this takes a little bit of effort. Particularly when you do it from the victim to you. Uh, from the, the person, who, the, the victimizer to you, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. I want you to, we want you to know, as your parents, we want you to know that we did the best we could, but we know we had a lot of gaps. And so we want you to go get help and take your feelings seriously. Even though we know we don't take out, we don't listen to our own feelings. Don't do like us. We know you need to, you were so good at doing your own thing because we were so stubborn and you didn't want to do our thing anyway. Please continue doing your own thing and get the help you need. We love you. We are ready to go and let go of this hurt. We love you. We may never choose to heal in the way you see it. And, and, and that's the best we can do. We're going to do what we do. We taught you to let go and do what you need to do. Please go and do what you need to do. Goodbye. Okay. So as you can see, that brings up, oof. So, so that brings up some painful stuff, okay? And needless to say, if I wanted to, I could go through that letter that I just narrated in my, in my head could be, three times as long if I went through every single thing I wrote down on this list here, okay? Every single thing you're going to, to write down and, and talk about or, 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 or write down on the list is going to bring up a, 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 a hard feeling, okay? And that's the idea is to really bring it up so that we, it, we can bring it up to the surface and address it, okay? That was definitely a, a heavy exercise. I'm feeling a lot of loose pieces sort of shaking up real deep inside right now. So to be honest with you, I'm gonna probably take a, have a nice, nice dinner and probably take it easy the rest of today. I'll probably, uh, yeah, nice dinner. I'm trying to move out of, uh, you know, alcohol as a way of dealing with my feelings. So I, I'm going to just focus on having a nice large bowl of soup and probably watch some comedy and just relax today. Uh, on a different day when I was feeling more upset, I absolutely would go to a store and buy a bottle of wine uh, or who knows what, right? But today is going to be soup. So, uh, okay. So that is the whole exercise from start to finish. Okay. You wrote down your wrote down your what happened to you in life you broke it down into one particular relationship sorting all this then you sorted all the statements let me uh, erase all this then you sorted all the statements out and then after you sort all the statements out you write a oh, yeah okay then after you sort all the statements out you write a letter where then you to that person who harmed you or that person write a letter from that person's voice to you so you can actually have that moment to say those things that need to get said so you can resolve the feelings okay and this is really good because it teaches you how to really use your voice in a real deep emotional way to get in touch with your feelings okay because many of us never had that right some of us had parents who would never apologize for anything right ever Okay, and then if you, hopefully you don't want to be one of those kinds of people. So, so uh, like, like, uh, like, like I grew up with. So, so, uh, so this is an opportunity to do that. Anytime you're feeling, I, like I said, I go through this maybe once every month or so, and I come up with different stuff every time. And it's literally stuff I would probably have never come up with if I hadn't specifically sat down to do this worksheet. Because, uh, you know, that thing that happened to me at seven happened and it's long, long over. So unless someone happened to ask me about it, which why would they? 
unless so unless a moment specific moment came to talk about it, I probably wouldn't talk about it. I would probably completely forget about it and just move on with my life. In particular, I had a moment when I was, uh, I guess, seven, eight, something that happened, and it happened, and then it kind of just be, everyone just moved on. You know, the next day we just moved on, and then and then no one talked about it. So you know, when I I wrote down one of these worksheets, I had a moment where I suddenly remembered it, and then was perplexed at how incredibly painful it was, and how could I not know how painful it was? And of course, I didn't know how painful it was because when it happened. It happened and then I just completely barreled it over. We all, everybody moved on. It would have been amazing as a little kid to go, no, 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 we absolutely need to process these feelings. I, I would not have had the mental ability to do that back then, right? I, I would not have had the mental ability to do that. Okay, when I was a little kid. So, so going through this over and over and over again is the way to grieve in a real healthy way. It teaches you really, um, it teaches you really useful skills for letting it all up and working with it as it comes up. And it's stuff's just gonna constantly keep coming up. Okay, so that's the important part about this exercise. Don't see it as a one time, write your life out kind of thing done. How you talk about your story, how you understand your story, make sense of it, unpackage it, changes constantly throughout your life. And so that's why it's important to get in touch with it. Okay. Okay. So with that, that is that is exercise three. Um, again, just please do this exercise over and over again if you if you're open to it. Um, Particularly if you're feeling any pain, hurt, fear, confusion, difficult feelings about what's going on right now in your life, it really helps you to see how what's going on right now is connected to what happened in the past. Okay. Okay, our final exercise uh, uh, next week will be um, actually, what is it? <laughs> I, it's either, I believe it's, we're going to do deconstructing beliefs. So a worksheet on how to deconstruct a belief. And we're going to look at story-based strategy, which is we're going to take some of this uh, timeline we just wrote and then you pick a story and then look at how we tell that story and ways in which we could tell it differently or tell it with more empowerment or compassion, understanding, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's super important for, for healing ourselves. Okay, so that's next week, deconstructing beliefs and story-based strategy. Okay. So uh, hopefully this information is helpful. Please feel free to share it with anybody and everybody. They're having a hard time. And uh, hopefully it was helpful for the person, for you watching this. And next week I will post the, uh, the next video on deconstructing beliefs. And uh, uh, after that, I will start uh, offering all of these classes for free, either on YouTube or Meetup, Zoom, or I'll, I'll pick a variety of platforms. I'm just gonna start offering all these classes Free for anyone who would like to access this material. Okay. That being said, that is all for today. Please take care of yourselves. Take care of your feelings. No one else. Well, let me uh, put the screen back on me here. No one else can. Uh, no one else is going to take care of your emotional life. It's your job. Uh, no one else is responsible for your feelings. You are, like it or not, for better or worse. Okay. 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 So with that, uh, take care. Have a nice week. Have a nice weekend. And I will see you next week. Namaste.